Okay, hello everyone and welcome to today's session of Virtually Golden. My name is Annie Albrecht with Golden United. Today is our last session of Virtually Golden and we are super excited to have a wonderful presentation on Golden's Railroads today. A couple technical housekeeping things. If you have any questions for the presenters, click the mute slash unmute button, which is at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You can unmute yourself, ask your question, and then later um, re-mute yourself again so that we don't have any background noise during the presentation. After the presentation's over later today, we will have the recording available on our YouTube channel, which you can access by visiting goldenunited.org and then clicking on the link on our um, homepage there. So if you have any friends or family or anyone who would like to see the presentation after this, they can access it on our YouTube channel um, at any point in the future. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kathy Smith to do the introductions for our presenters today. Kathy? Thank you very much, Annie, and thanks for all you've been doing for Golden United. Um, today, we're gonna hear about Golden's Railroads uh, with Bill Roby and Paul Hazeman. Uh, Paul's been one of our frequent speakers, which we really appreciate. Um, He's uh, currently serves on uh, the Golden City Council and is president of Leadership Golden. He's a retired army officer and aerospace attorney. And uh, Bill Roby is new to us uh, for this presentation. Bill's been a resident of Golden since 1963, except for five years in the army flying helicopters. He grew up in Massachusetts and has been interested in trains and railroads all his life. He's been a volunteer at the Colorado Railroad Museum for over 20 years and a trustee since 2003. He has a degree in engineering geology from Mines and considers himself a closet golden historian. He's contributed to several articles about uh, Golden's uh, railroads and he's basically joined up with Paul Hazeman to put together this presentation today. Take it away. Well, howdy, howdy. Uh, here we are, and we want to emphasize, since we happen to know that one of the viewers is a fellow named Dan Abbott that knows more about railroads and has written a few books about them. So he, he just joined us today probably to intimidate the hell out of us. So this is really just a brief overview. And Dan, I see you smirking in the background. Uh, so this away we go. So here we are. Uh, Railroads are going to be the key to Colorado's economic vitality. It was a long way to Tipperary. That's a, I guess, a World War I song. Uh, but it's even further to Fort Leavenworth, which was the capital of the Kansas Territory. Ten days by wagon, and that's not easy days. In fact, we'll talk later about the city of Strasburg, where a couple of the railroads met. But that was originally called Comanche Crossing for good reason. Uh, so it was uh, hazardous and expensive to bring goods across the uh, Great Plains from Fort Leavenworth. So they needed a railroad connection. Colorado Territory needed it. And meanwhile, the Transcontinental Railroad had started in 1863, and it kind of ignored Colorado with its on-again, off-again mining economy, uh, despite people trying really hard to get a connection, they, they decided to go through Wyoming. And I just, you know, knowing a little bit about geology, it, the Rocky Mountains nearby might have had something to do with their decision to choose Wyoming uh, and not uh, probably mostly to do with their choice. With this backdrop though, Golden and Denver now vied for a connection to the Transcontinental Railroad. And what ensued was the railroad wars to achieve its goal to connect to Cheyenne Golden residents, Loveland and Bertha and a couple others uh, got together and really wanted to get a, a uh, railroad started. And they, the two of them founded the Colorado Central Railroad in 1865. Uh, by 1867, the Transcontinental Railroad had made it to Cheyenne. And boy, Loveland was really on the stick there he entered into an agreement with the Union Pacific to develop a spur from Cheyenne to Golden. Good deal. Unfortunately, you know, there's the deal. They, they 
the uh, Loveland would, would provide the rail bed, the bridges, ties, and the UP would lay the track. And it's a good plan, but a bond issue in Jefferson County kind of fell flat. Meanwhile, Denver is sitting quietly nearby, well, not so quietly. In November, former Governor Evans and other prominent Denverites decided to form the Board of Trade, supposedly to secure a railroad to Denver. It might have been its main purpose, but it had other reasons, as you'll see in a minute. A week later, Evans led the formation of the Denver Pacific, and that was their railroad with eyes headed north. And still later in November, my no coincidence, Henry Brown of Brown Palace fame donated 10 acres of, of probably useless ground. It was kind of on a hill in, <laughs> to, for a future capital. And so Denver not only wanted a railroad, but they, for the economic reasons, but they wanted the railroad to uh, increase its stature so they could steal the territorial capital from Golden. And that was a different talk. Uh, Denver won the railroad, railroad wars. It stole the capital in December of 1867. And in June of 1870, Loveland was able to connect through the CCR in Colorado Central to, uh, oh, it connects to Cheyenne uh, in June. In August, the Kansas Pacific connects at Strasburg at Comanche Crossing, and they changed the name to Strasburg because one of the Kansas Pacific employees was named Strasburg or Strauss. And so that's how it got its name. But for Golden, the important thing was that the Colorado Central Eastern Division connected to Golden, Golden to Denver in, in September. So we at least got the railroad running from Golden through the uh, Jersey Junction, three miles north of downtown Denver and then up to Cheyenne. So there was railroad connections to Cheyenne, but not directly, but through, through Jersey Junction and through Denver. Meanwhile, there's been gold and then there are hills and our, our Golden's future is still linked to the railroads. Loveland now decides he's gonna go up the mountain and he has Edward Berthet who has already done some survey work. He's worked in the Panama Canal and other places. I think he begins to uh, survey a route for a narrow gauge route. And narrow gauge is three feet, six inches of Clear Creek to the mines in Black Hawk, Idaho Springs, Georgetown, and Central City. The reason Central City was last is that the distance, be the elevation between Black Hawk and Central City is over 500 feet and it may be close by, but it's high. So Berth had used his best engineering and did one of his loops to get the railroad up to uh, Central City from Black Hawk, but it, as you can see, took a while. So the, the um, Colorado Central, the Mountain Division, brings down gold, silver, and lots of other uh, ores back to Golden. And we have six smelters in Golden. And I think the key word for smelter is smell. And it must have been just horrific living in the at least downwind of the uh, smelters because they used a, sul a sulfur, sulfur process, sulfide process to do the smelting. And it must have smelled just terrible. But smelting was a big business for Golden. And here are a couple pictures that shows the this is the, the Y going up the canyon. The, on the left is going to, to Idaho Springs, and on the right is going to Black Hawk, and it's named uh, Forks Creek, but some people just call it the, you know, a, 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 you know one of the tributaries to uh, Clear Creek. And here's just another, you know, Gens's narrow gauge coming down Clear Creek Canyon. And finally over here, if you want to see a reel and not a replica, go to Central City, and that, uh, locomotive is still there. The one that you might pass in, in Black Hawk is not real. It's a replica. But Loveland still dreams about Cheyenne. And so in 1872, he headed north. Initially narrow gauge on the east side of, of uh, North Table Mountain. 
uh, he gets to uh, Ralston in the narrow gauge road, railroad. He is just doing that to access the Murphy Mine, which is about, I don't know, maybe five miles to the, to the west. And to bring coal down from the Murphy Mine, it was a big struggle with the mules and wagons to get it there. But at least they now had access to the coal in the Murphy Mine. And of course, Loveland had a customer. Uh, so to get up that side of the mountain, of uh, North Table Mountain, they created a new junction called the Arapaho or Golden Junction, a mile or so east of Golden. And if you go to the Railroad Museum and go about another, I don't know, half a mile or a quarter mile uh, further east, or maybe even a quarter mile, that's where that junction was. And that uh, junction is where they turned left with that narrow gauge road. So it was narrow gauge, but the main road to, to Denver was a standard gauge. So they had you know, a third track laid going uh, as far as the Arapaho Junction on the main line and a narrow gauge north. So in 1873, Colorado Central went to a standard gauge uh, up that side of, on the east side of North Table Mountain and headed for Cheyenne, but ah, nuts. Here we have the 1873 financial pan, uh, panic that dried up funding. So you have to pan ahead about five years and Union Pacific funding was again available in 1878. And the CCRR's Cheyenne Division made it to Cheyenne and fulfilled Loveland's dream of a direct route for the Colorado Central from Golden to Cheyenne. And he was, I guess, for a short period, was a happy man. Uh, just as a side note, to complete the route, track was relayed up Tucker, Tucker Gulch. Now, the normal elevation grade or grade is like a 3% or 2%. And going up Tucker Gulch, what do you think, Bill? 3% or 4%? Somewhere in that vicinity. Yeah, a steeper grade, and that's why they didn't go up there first. But I say May, but it was really in February, so we'll have to fix that. And those tracks are still <laughs> visible today. Over here in this picture, if you go down in Golden, if you go out forward and, uh, and turn right on First Street and go down to Tucker Gulch and go across the bridge there at First Street and park your car carefully on the other side of the bridge, you can walk up that grassy trail there and just be careful you don't stumble over those rails. When the developers put in the housing development over there, they uh, got in a hurry and didn't take out the rails. And so you've got some old, old, old rails still running up Tucker Gulch. And here is the roundhouse. You can't see much of it from this picture, so I drew an arrow. Here it is looking from the other direction. It was on the east side of, of, uh, of Goose Town. And it was built in 1872 and lasted until 1927. Local historian Richard Gardner sent me this picture if you want to go out and you're just, you have, you know, for example, if you just really have nothing better to do, which might be something we all <laughs> suffer from these days, you could go out to the, and go across the railroad tracks on the far side of Goose Town and look for that, uh, that uh, graffiti there and you'd see a remnant of the old roundhouse. So that was the, uh, the roundhouse and, and that was the CCNR. Uh, but they had struggles. And here you'll enjoy this particular one. So the UP financed the rail routes uh, and in the process controlled the CCRR. And in this role, Jay Gould in Boston exercised a lot of tough love. And I never met uh, Bill Loveland, as you might imagine, but I've read enough about him to know how much he hated being controlled and chafed at those tight reins. So prior to a May 1876 board meeting, Bertha as secretary noted that the UP failed to give its agent power to vote the UP proxies for the meeting. And so at the meeting, the directors reinstated control in the CCRR to Loveland. And uh, well, it's, that's how it works in some of these boardrooms. It didn't take long though. So here we are May and now we're down in August. So lawsuits followed 
and I say to which Lovell was no stranger. As the UP now tried to force the Colorado Central into bankruptcy and take total control. So that was, a, you know, we got a bankruptcy issue here. There was going to be a bankruptcy hearing on the 15th of August. And David Moffat of Moffat Tunnel fame and other fame uh, was to be the receiver in bankruptcy. The train was held up. You, you, you hear about that in the Wild West about trains being held up. Well, they got held up right here. And mass gunmen stopped the train, kidnapped Judge Stone, and the hearing didn't occur. Stone was released the next day and said he couldn't identify his kidnappers. Uh huh, maybe, maybe not. But in any event, kind of rough justice. But in any event, the UP and Loveland eventually reached a more equitable understanding. And for example, uh, Loveland was elected president by the board in uh, December of 1878. So things got better and the CCNRR and, and uh, Jay Gould were able to get along a little longer. But there was some derailing going on and the uh, waning Colorado mining and competing routes hurt the Colorado Central. As a result, uh, Colorado Central abandoned its route to Fort Collins in 1889. And later that year, it pulled up track from Ralston to Fort Collins. And in 1898, the track was further derailed between North Golden and Ralston. The remaining track north was essentially a spur up the Gulch, Tucker Gulch to the Golden Press Brickyard in North Golden off Spider Co Way, which remained until abandoned in 1941. And looking at some cl closer maps today that his uh, historian highness Bill Roby brought over to my house, we note that that spur may have gone just a little bit further to uh, the bottom of the trail coming off North Table Mountain. There you can see the remnants of a, the earthen remnants of a loading stipple for the the aggregate mines on top of the mountain. And it shows that the rail spur extended that far as well, which might have been another couple of hundred yards. As to the mountain division, passenger service ended. And in March, it, uh, the rail from Idaho Springs was torn up. And in May, the train up Clear Creek, you know, made its last run. So that was it for the for the mountain division and and pretty much that was it for the CCRR. But I won't go through all this. You can look at it. It survived in various names from long ago to the present. And here is kind of the heritage, if, if you cared one whit uh, about the heritage. You could uh, see <clears throat> that we're down now when you see the BNSF trains pulling into, uh, into cores. That's the same, the same right away the same route that uh, Bill Loveland put in in 1870. So kind of interesting. And there's your Colorado Central. Here's a map just to show a few of those things. This route here goes over to Jersey Junction, comes down just as it did then, as it does now, into Golden and into Coors. Um, Meanwhile, here's the route up Tucker Gulch, right there, going up Tucker Gulch. And it kind of went over like that. Previously, as you see right here, previously it went up on the other side, and here's that junction uh, where it used to go up on the other side of the mountain. The railroad museum is right there where that arrow is. So if you want to walk past the railroad museum, or drive slowly towards McIntyre Road. That's where the old rail route went up the other side of, of North Table Mountain. Bill Brown at the museum says that the uh, route didn't get quite this close uh, as it shows here. It might have went north a little sooner than that, but uh, those are being nitpicking. Another route that they did when they wanted to get to the Murphy Mine was this section right here uh, and was later extended down to the Glencoe uh, mine. So that's some interesting history on the Colorado Central. And now 
let's hear from from Bill. So Paul has told us about uh, the railroad efforts by Loveland, so that by the 1880s, uh, lines were heading east, west, and north out of Golden. But uh, what Golden really needed to maintain a dominant position over Denver was to have a railroad to the south. So railroads would extend out of Golden in all four directions. In 1872, the Golden City and South Platte was incorporated by Loveland, Welch, and Berthet. We call them Golden's Big Three, somewhat like the Central Pacific's uh, Big Four that built the railroad west from Sacramento. So they planned a 17 mile line out of Golden to connect down south uh, near Littleton. Uh, it was going to be a three foot narrow gauge line and bypass um, all of Denver to put uh, Golden in the cat seat. It was nearly all graded by 1872, but by 1873, the financial pan panic uh, halted the efforts. So a few years went by and um, in 1876 to 1879, Track line, track line began for the Golden City and South Platte uh, at a junction with the Colorado Central Railroad at East Street. The, road, the route crossed Clear Creek heading south and then south along Jackson Street to eventually uh, wind up at 24th and Jackson in the vicinity of the, uh, the high school. And I'll see if I can figure out how to advance the slide here. Okay, Paul, there we go. Uh, this is from uh, either the top of Castle, yeah, it's probably from the top of Castle Rock. East Street and the Colorado Central Railroad is here. The line came directly south down East Street, crossed Clear Creek to 12th and then up to 13th and then from 13th it headed diagonally to Ford and then over to Jackson. The line then went southwest across the golf course area on the uh, south side of Kinney Run. It then curved east and ascended the hillside at the south end of the golf course, then kind of curved around to the southwest through the Golden Cemetery area and continued southwest to the Parvet Clay Pits in the Rooney I-70 Road area. A short spur continued up Kinney Run on the west side of Sixth Avenue to serve the uh, Cambria lime kiln which uh, supplied bricks for the Texas uh, Fire Brick Company that was uh, down in Golden in the vicinity of uh, 13th and East. There was never more than three and a half miles of track on this line and it operated for about two and a half years until the mid 1882 when a major flood on Clear Creek led to its abandonment. Well, we gotta do something about this. Here's an overview of Golden. Uh, it's an aerial. Uh, the yellow arrow indicates uh, 13th and Jackson. Then the red arrow is 24th and Jackson. The line between the two is the Jackson Street alignment. And then the rest of the arrows pretty much trace where the uh, Golden City and South Platte headed southwest across the high school area and the uh, golf course. And then it made a sweeping turn. Whoops. So it came down here along the south side of Kinney Run, made a sweeping curve, and then ascended the grade at the south end, at the north end of where the uh, golf course clubhouse is, and then sweeped around to the south and then south west on up to the clay pits. I'm not familiar with Paul's mouse. So that line was pretty much done, but uh, it's not over. Uh, th this whole process of getting a line built out of Golden just keeps on going. Eight years later, um, the Denver, Lakewood, and Golden Railroad was incorporated in 1890. And guess what? The early directors were the same big three of Golden, Loveland, Berthard, and Welch. Golden granted a right-of-way along Jackson Street to the Denver, Lakewood, and Golden, 
for the very north end of the line coming out of Denver. Uh, so they granted the right of way from 24th Street to 13th Street. Now this was the uh, abandoned line of the Golden and, and uh, South Platts line. And uh, there became complications when the uh, Santa Fe Railroad, which was a line attending to come up to Denver, said that they had purchased the right-of-way rights along Jackson Street from the original Golden City and South Platte. And then it was further complicated by a new paper railroad, the Denver Apex and Western, that claimed option rights from the Santa Fe Railroad. So now there were two different entities vying for the same right-of-way. But the big three, um, the Swiss Loveland and Berthoud and Welch, still had stock in the old Golden City and South Platte. They said that the right-of-way sale to the uh, Denver Santa Fe never really happened, that it was a myth. So in 1891, uh, because they still had the controlling stock in the original line, they said that the grant was a myth and that the, they granted the rights to the Denver Lakewood and Golden. In retaliation, uh, the Denver Apex and Weston, which thought they had the rights that were taken away from them, they schemed to take possession of the right-of-way along Jackson Street by secretly planning to build track on the Jackson Street right-of-way late on a Sunday night. Uh, the Denver Lakewood and Golden got word that this was going to happen, and they got there on Friday night before the Sunday, and before the Lakewood, Denver Lakewood and Golden had their track down, they had their track down by Saturday night. Outmaneuvered, the Denver Apex and Western filed for an injunction, but it was denied. So in the end, the Denver Lakewood and Golden wound up with that contested right away along Jackson Street. The rails from Denver reached 13th in Washington on 9 September 1891. This line was built to a standard gauge, which is four feet, eight and a half inches, as opposed to the three foot narrow gauge. Uh, Denver Lakewood and Golden uh, wanted to reach the coal mine area north of Golden, uh, up in the Glencoe area. And in 1894, they began a branch uh, which started out in Golden on E Street and then extended west along the north bank of Clear Creek. And then it curved across to the north and northeast across the Colorado Central Railway. And then along the west side of North Golden to serve these clay pits and coal mines that were as far Far north is Tyndall, which is in the Ralston Dam area. And this is not the same line as the Colorado Central Railroad that uh, went up Tucker Gulch a little bit further on the east side. In July of 1896, flooding in Tucker Gulch damaged this track and that line up to the Tyndall mine was not reopened. This is a very interesting view from the northwest side of Golden looking southeast. Uh, in the foreground, you can see the uh, roadbed and the track of the Denver Lakewood and Golden. This is taken from the hill knob about where the Mitchell Elementary School is now, looking again southeast. And I think the intersection that's indicated by the red arrow is possibly Fifth and Cheyenne. And this would be before the uh, houses were extended further north. So on the south side, the Denver Lakewood and Golden, uh, heading down Jackson Street, um, they built a short spur to serve Parfitt's Rockwell clay mine at about 20th Street. And if you're driving south on Jackson Street and look to the west, on west, west 20th Street behind the evergreen trees, you'll notice that there's a concrete loading tipple or a loading platform that is still there. And uh, that was where the coal from clay, clay from the Parfitt mine uh, was loaded out uh, for the trip into uh, Denver or Golden to make bricks. Uh, the Denver Lakewood and Golden also built a spur to serve into Coors in 1895. Uh, further south, another spur went southwest to the Parfitt's Rooney Road clay mines from a Y that was built in the track near South Golden Road and Quaker Street. Uh, that location was called Wyman. And as you drive south on Ulysses Street, just before you come to the crossing uh, of the RTD, 
If you look carefully, you can see some of the rail bed that's still there crossing at, at diagonal. Now, Golden was told from the very beginning that the Denver Lakewood and Golden would run with fancy electric cars, but uh, uh, they didn't have the electric cars from the start, the electric street cars, and they ran with steam. They kept running with steam locomotive despite Golden's threat to not grant right-of-way extensions until they got in the, uh, the electric system. Denver Lakewood and Golden was losing dollars right and left, but they continued to operate after being placed in receivership in 1896. And it's from this point that uh, the uh, never ending story continues. Here's a picture of one of the little steam locomotives pulling a big coach uh, that was somewhere along the uh, Denver Lakewood and Golden line, probably down in Lakewood someplace. Those uh, little steam locomotives came from uh, the New York elevated system. Uh, back in New York City. So um, the Denver Lakewood and Golden keeps morphing into something else. It just keeps on going. In 1904, the Denver Lakewood and Golden was sold at foreclosure to the Denver and Inter Mountain Railway. This uh, DNIM continued to operate fifthly with this dirty steam until 1907 when the Inter Mountain Railway acquired control. The Intermountain Railway finally electrified the line to Golden in 1909. In 1909, the Intermountain Railway was bought out and the name was changed to the Denver and Intermountain Railroad Company. In 1910, the Denver and Intermountain Railroad Company sold to the Denver Tramway, but it still operated as the Denver and Intermountain. So through all of these name changes, there were financial problems and uh, they had to come up with new financial backing new organization and they had to come up with new names and sometimes just simply changing a letter from a small M to a big M was enough to accomplish the name change. So now we'll look at some photos of the Denver in the mountain probably taken during the 40s. This is uh, looking uh, basically east on 14th Street uh, with Ford Crossing in the foreground and the Catholic Church in the background, the original Catholic Church. Uh, the car is headed towards Golden. And if I st st stop hitting the... So this is just a little further east. Uh, this is about 16th in Jackson. Uh, it shows the trestle across Kinney Run. Uh, this is about where, um, uh, where the um, Burger King is today. This is still a little bit further south. This shows a car headed into Golden coming down the South Golden Road area at the vicinity of 24th and Jackson. And the, the little uh, depot building in the background was called the Industrial School Stop on the DNIM. We're now even further south. This is Wyman. Uh, this is where the track branched south down to the Rooney Road area. Um, Quaker Street is in the foreground. The intersection with Quaker Street and South Golden Road is just a little bit to the left. Uh, this train is headed towards Denver. A little further south, we are down at Camp George West. South Golden Road is just to the right, and essentially everything that's in this picture except for the trolley car is still there today, and it looks pretty much the same. And this is a view looking northeast of uh, West Colfax Avenue, where Denver West is now. Uh, this trolley car is headed towards Denver. Uh, and down into the White Acres area. In 1941, uh, the Associated Railroads acquired the right to operate freight on the Denver and Intermountain to serve a branch line that went to the Remington Arms Plant, which of course now is the Federal Center. And this continued until 1953. As you drive east on Highway 6 and go underneath uh, the overpass where the RTD goes over, uh, that used to be a grade crossing uh, of this particular line that went to the Federal Center. Occasionally, you'd have to stop there when the train uh, went over to service that facility. Uh, the last round trip into Golden for the DNIM on Route 84 was June 3rd, 1950. Uh, DNIM car number 25 is now fully restored and kept at the Federal Center. Uh, the Denver Tramway became the RTD in 1974. The W line follows the original Denver Lakewood and Golden alignment along 13th Ave to Oak Street 
and uh, the DNM line to the federal center. And then the new alignment goes, of course, along the west side of Highway 6, crosses over at Indiana, and goes to the uh, Jeffco station uh, where it terminates. The grand opening of the W line to Golden was on April 26, 2013. And there's the uh, celebration and all the people who are experiencing that, that fine day. Um, Along came some competition for the Denver Lakewood and Golden. In 1901, uh, David Moffat, uh, he planned an electric line to go to Salt Lake City with a very interesting gauge of three feet, six inches. The initial line extended from Denver up to Arvada and went to, to Leiden to, uh, to service uh, the coal mines that were up there in the Leiden Creek area. Uh, in order to go to Golden, they need to consider a 10 mile extension that went from Arvada Junction to Golden along the north side of Clear Creek. At this time, the Denver Lakewood and Golden was still running the dirty steam locomotives, and uh, the Denver and Northwestern's uh, new electric cars represented a big competitive threat. The Denver and Northwestern planned route into Golden from Arvada. It crossed, crossed Clear Creek east of the brewery and just west of where the Colorado Railroad Museum is today. The planned route was to use a key strip of land that was owned by Welsh interests uh, that was adjacent to the agricultural ditch in a very confined area on the south side of the Coors Brewery, where you now on 32nd Avenue or 13th uh, drive underneath that malt house building. Uh, in order to thwart the efforts of the Denver and Northwestern, the Welsh interests sold this land to the Denver Lakewood and Golden so that they could block uh, the Denver and Northwestern from having any right of way. Uh, the Denver Lakewood and Golden also tried to stop the Denver and Northwestern by stopping them from crossing their rail line at E Street. Lawsuits followed uh, and eventually the Denver and Northwestern prevailed in court and they gained its needed right of way into Golden. In April 9, 1904, the first car rolled into Golden on the new Route 83. Here is a picture of the celebration of that car arriving in Golden at 12th and E Streets uh, 12th and Washington, excuse me, with Hotel Bella Vista in the background. Uh, the Denver Northwestern crossed Clear Creek, as we said before, just west of the Colorado Railroad Museum, then along the south side of Coors, and it made an S curve into Golden, so they'd go from 13th onto the 12th Street alignment. The original loop uh, that the Denver Northwestern made in downtown Golden as it came into Golden from the east on 12th Street, was to turn south on Washington Avenue, then west on 13th, then north on Arapaho, and then back east on 12th. Uh, in order to uh, outclass the uh, Denver Lakewood and Golden, they built a fine depot on 13th, uh, just west of Washington Avenue. And this uh, looked far, far superior to the uh, Denver Lakewood and Golden's facilities, which were nothing, the tracks just terminated on 13th Street, just east of Washington. The uh, Denver and Northwestern also had loadout facilities for a rock quarry on West 44th Avenue, just west of where the Railroad Museum was. And they used this, uh, they, they used this material for construction work in Denver and also for their track. The last round trip on Route 83 to Golden was on uh, July 2nd in 1950. Uh, Here's a map that uh, is somewhat similar to the one that uh, we, Paul just showed. This is the route from Arvada Junction along the north side of Clear Creek past the Railroad Museum, crossed Clear Creek and then into Golden on 13th and then S curve over onto 12th. The Denver and Inner Mountain line, uh, it followed South Golden Road and then 13th into Denver. This is Wyman where the track ran to the clay pits on Rooney Road. Here's a picture of a uh, Denver and Northwestern car headed towards Denver uh, after having gone around the reverse curve, the S curve from 12th Street to the 13th Street alignment. Here is a car on 12th Street near the original Mitchell Elementary School, uh, just approaching Ford. That's headed towards Golden. 
Here is the fine brick depot that the Denver Northwestern built on 13th Street between Washington and Arapahoe. This would be very close to where the uh, back door is of the, the Foss building, for lack of a better term. Downtown Golden had some very fascinating little trolley loops. Uh, the blue line here is the Denver and Northwestern making the S curve from 13th to 12th and into Golden. And then uh, south on Washington and then west on 14th, north on Arapaho and back. The pink is the uh, DNIM that came in and basically terminated here at 13th and Washington. But they at one time originally had a loop so that they could make a turn. But that one went from Jackson to 12th to Washington and back on 14th. Uh, these were ultimately uh, abandoned, and in the very end, the only thing that was left was the line that terminated at 13th and Washington. Here's a Denver Northwestern car uh, headed southbound on Washington and turning west on 13th uh, to go up to their fancy depot. This is the intersection of 12th and Jackson. Uh, this shows a Denver Northwestern car that has just come up 12th and is now turning east on Jackson. Here's another picture of the same intersection looking southeast. And you can see the dual gauge right here between the standard gauge, four feet, eight and a half inches, and then the three foot six inch gauge of the Denver and Northwestern. Uh, DNIM car headed uh, north on Washington Avenue. Uh, it would make the turn on 12th Street and then east on Jackson to complete the loop. Here's the Denver and Northwestern that shared facilities in the later days with the Denver and Intermountain at the stop at 13th and Washington. Here's another picture of two cars at the termination of the line when they were finally combined at 13th and Washington. So on that last picture, uh, if I go back to it, you'll notice in the background Castle Rock, and there is this little lineation going up the side of the mountain. And uh, that's what Paul's gonna talk about next. So fun, fun, fun for the killers. <coughs> in uh, 1909, John Walker built a funicular up Mount Morrison. And boy, that was a, a good deal south of here. And it kind of spurred some interest in Golden. So two competing funiculars were built in Golden in 1912 and in 1913, one up Lookout Mountain and one up South Table Mountain. Reese Midler, uh, you know, formed a Lookout Mountain Development Company and planned a development on top of Lookout Mountain as a resort. He needed a way to get there and he needed to get investors and guests up the mountain. So in 1912, he opened his funicular with the assistance from Walker. A year later, much to his minor chagrin, uh, Cement Bill Williams built Lookout Mountain Road. Auto travel up this new road was new and exciting and eventually put Reese Midler's funicular out of business and the Lockett Lookout Mountain Development Company assets were sold in a sheriff's sale in 1919. Meanwhile, and interestingly, Denver Mountain Park System established its first mountain park when it bought acreage on Lookout Mountain and talked Buffalo Bill's sister into burying Buffalo Bill in their new Lookout Mountain Park. George Parfit, the head of the Mason Lodge in Golden, let the procession up Lookout Mountain Road and officiated at his burial. So here, that was uh, the Lookout Mountain funicular. So across the, across the valley, Charles Quintins had started with mule, mule rides up to Castle Rock in 1908. They mounted downtown at the Dim Station and at Washington and 12th as Bill told you. Viewing Vidler's new funicular across the valley, he built his own funicular a year later in 1913. 
the funicular took tourists up the pavilion and dance hall atop Castle Rock, and a lighted route made evening rides an added pleasure. The funicular versus his prior mule rides was conveniently started at the north side dim 83 East Golden Stop near Coors. So you could get off the uh, trolley car, take a short walk and get on the funicular. This funicular operated as a tourist ride until the fall of 1916, as the advent of auto tourist travel took the shine off funiculars, both for Lookout Mountain funicular as well as the one up South Table Mountain. But the pavilion stayed open for various activities until it suspiciously burned down in 1927, and I'm sure that someone could enjoy talking more about that, but it had nothing to do with the funicular. So here we are talking about some other Golden Railroads. Bill, back to you. We're running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. We're overboard. The uh, Denver Middle Park uh, headed up towards Ralston Creek and up into the Glencoe area. Uh, originally, it was going to go uh, all the way into South Park. Um, we also had a railroad at Heritage Square, which is originally called Magic Mountain. And of course, we have a railroad at Coors, and we have another railroad in Golden called the Golden City and San Juan. Uh, here's a picture of engine number 42, which was a three foot gauge that was built for Magic Mountain. This is crossing the trestle at the entrance. The trestle, of course, is still there. The locomotive is now down in uh, the roundhouse on display in Durango. Here's a couple of the locomotives at Coors. Uh, they actually have a fairly extensive railroad system. It uh, starts from down uh, where the branch is off the uh, Colorado and Southern or the Burlington route there at um, Mount Olivet Cemetery, and then comes all the way up through the valley and almost all the way into Golden, where it's inside the building on various transfer tables. Then last but not least, we have the Golden City in San Juan, which is the name of the railroad at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Uh, picture on the right is the queen of our fleet, uh, engine number 346. And there we have it, probably a little bit over time. Well, we may be over time, but you know, do we have any questions if anyone is still left? Dan, you don't get to ask questions, only answers. Okay, not hearing any questions. We'll uh, say thank you for listening and look forward to uh, having you view this some other time with your friends on Golden United's YouTube page. Back to you, Kathy. Thank you so much for this great comprehensive uh, review of Golden's Railroads. Um, a lot of information there, so I hope uh, Hope the Railroad Museum and the History Museum can make use of this too. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and this is our last uh, uh, virtually golden in the series. So thank you everyone, our loyal attendees who have uh, 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 attended these, these last month and a half and, and of course our presenters. And I uh, wanna thank Annie, her company, High Road Services uh, high-road-services.com. And uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, we can uh, uh, have this available on our Golden United website, goldenunited.org, uh, which will take you to the YouTube page. So please tell your friends that uh, there's a bunch of good watching there. Thank you so much, everyone. Annie, do you have anything to close us out? Nope, you covered everything, but thank you all so much for joining us over the past month and a half. It's been wonderful learning about golden history and all the wonderful culture there. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you have any questions at all, um, you can also contact us via the contact form on goldenunited.org. And with that, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Thank well, you Well, thank you, Annie. Thank you very much, Annie Albrecht. Annie runs High Road Services dot com with dashes between high road and services so if you need any help like this kind of help please contact annie yeah thank you paul if you guys ever need any uh, marketing or communication or tech services i'm here to help thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your day bye everyone